Marina, you're welcome to start. Okay, so good afternoon and welcome members of the IRCNAT. Uh, my name is Marina Vivaralli and I'm a pediatric nephrologist working at the Bambino Gesù Children's Hospital in Rome, in Italy. And um, I'm truly delighted today to introduce um, our speaker, um, Dr. William Morello. William Morello is a brilliant um, young nephrologist working in the Division of Pediatric Nephrology um, under the um, uh, responsibility of Professor Giovanni Montini in Milan, in Northern Italy. And um, William Morello will present to us the results of an important trial called the PREDICT trial, which has looked at the use of prophylactic antibiotic in um, children with different um, degrees of vesicoureteral reflux. And this trial has been a great success story um, for Italians and Europeans because it has been published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And um, we anticipate a lot of debate, so prepare your, um, your debate hat and be prepared to ask lots of questions at the end. I will try to get some debate going. And without further ado, since these results are really um, interesting, I um, uh, leave the floor to William Morello and thank him so much for being here. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank for, thanks for the invitation. Um, I will show you the results of the PREDICT trial, but let me start with an introduction on why we started this trial. As you know, we have a, a very different prenatal dilation that may be, may be very, very, very small, uh, prenatal dilation up to uh, a damaged kidney with a very huge prenatal dilation. Uh, you know, we have a, a different uh, um, uh, algorithm to try to manage these patients who are born with a prenatal dilation that is later confirmed uh, after the, the birth. And we, uh, we know that the management of patients with a, a low risk prenatal dilation, that means um, no uh, uh, urinary tract abnormalities and a very small dilation is quite easy. We do not have to, to do anything further. Uh, while uh, we have the uh, opposite op op site extreme, that is uh, um, the, the posterior urethral valves with the lutus, the, 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 um, that means uh, a, a very difficult situation to, to be managed that needs to be uh, addressed uh, at birth and sometimes even before birth. But what about the, the, the what is in the middle? So uh, a prenatal dilation that is later confirmed and uh, uh, and is in uh, uh, needs to be addressed to understand what is going on and what is uh, uh, needed to be done. In most cases, we have uh, these patients are patients with vesicle urethral reflux, and we will try to understand what is needed to be done for those patients. So uh, maybe some of you uh, already know what is, or most of you already know what is vesicle urethral reflux, but let's remind it for everybody. Vesicle urethral reflux is a condition in which urine flows back from the bladder to the kidneys and can be classified according to the grade of uh, the, um, the, the, the the back flow uh, from the bladder to the kidney and also the dilation of the urinary tracts and the, uh, the, 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 the kidney. So we have, a, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, uh, but we have a low grade reflux when it's grade one or two, and we have high grade reflux when uh, is, uh, the VUR is more than three. Uh, uh, is, uh, yes, the pointer uh, worked, William. Okay, we can see. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, what if vesicle urethral reflux is is a benign or not benign condition is still debated. As you can see, we have different uh, opinions according to the experts. Um, but uh, why do we have to look for vesicle urethral reflux? Uh, mostly because the uh, the um, 
alterated the abnormal flow of the urine puts those children at risk of urinary tract infection, mostly uh, recurrent urinary tract infection. And uh, some motors, or basically uh, uh, most of the others, uh, were um, thinking that uh, the recurrent urinary tract infection or even the vesicular urinary reflux could be associated with renal damage. So the reason why we are looking for VUR is urinary tract infection and renal damage. What about urinary tract infection? We know that uh, the, the higher is the, view, the VUR grade, the higher is the risk of recurrent urinary tract infection. This is a meta-analysis performed from the American Academy of Pediatrics for their guidelines as they put together more than 500 patients with urinary tract infection and they checked if they if the, there was vesicular urethral reflux. As you can see, um, uh, patients with no urethral reflux or um, uh, low-grade uh, vesicular urethral reflux have a low risk of recurrence that is uh, of urinary tract infection that can be quantified at, uh, around 5%. Uh, when the VUR increases, in, uh, also the risk of uh, recurrent urinary tract infection increases. And as you can see, when you have a, a VUR grade 3, you have a, a more than 25% uh, risk of recurrent urinary tract infection. But when you have VUR grade 4, you have a 42% risk of recurrent urinary tract infection. So uh, we know that VUR is a uh, an important uh, risk factor for urinary tract infection. Uh, this is another meta-analysis that was done after the uh, another important study on the VUR, the REVUR study, and put together all the studies that have tried to use antibiotic prophylaxis, so uh, a low dose of continuous antibiotics every day, to prevent urinary tract infection in children with a, um, a VUR. A, and uh, as you can see, in according to this meta-analysis, both in patients with dilating VUR, so grade three, four, and five, and in patients without dilating um, VUR, according to this meta-analysis after the REVO trial, well, antibiotic prophylaxis seems to reduce the risk of urinary tract infection. But uh, this meta-analysis was performed after the REVO trial that, mm, that was an important study on that topic and enrolled uh, more than 600 um, patients after a first urinary tract infection with vesicular urethral reflux. As you can see, in that case, uh, most patients were females, 92% of patients in the REVO trial were females, and most of patients had a very low grade reflux with uh, VUR grade one, two, and three accounting for more than 90% of children. Uh, so uh, yes, they found a difference in the, in the a primary outcome that was the reduction of urinary recurrent urinary tract infection because they enrolled patients who had already had at least one or sometimes even two urinary tract infection, but there was no difference in the secondary outcome uh, that was renal scarring according to the study group. Uh, moreover, this is the day kaplan meyer for the primary endpoint. As you can see, there is a difference in uh, in the incidence of urinary tract infection in patients with uh, prophylaxis or without prophylaxis the the first curve is without prophylaxis the second one is the with prophylaxis but uh, even if there was a statistically significant difference uh, among the two groups they had very high uh, the very large number needed to treat so 16 patients needed to be treated for two years of antibiotics to, to prevent uh, 
one UTI and the number needed to treat increases to 22 if we consider only febrile UTI. So while the the significant the statistical um, the data were statistically significant, the clinical value of this of this data need to still to be discussed at least. But what about renal damage? Uh, we have performed uh, a few years ago, uh, um, oh, sorry, this is again the REVO study. And uh, as I just told you, the renal scarring was not different among the two groups, uh, according, um, sorry, according to the two groups, there the, the was no difference for the uh, in, uh, occurrence of new kidney scarring. And while there was a difference in antimicrobial resistance in in the two groups of course patient receiving antibiotic prophylaxis that is a low dose of antibiotics every day for at least two years uh, they had an increased risk of uh, uh, resistance to uh, e coli in their infections so this is instead the meta-analysis that I want I wanted to show you, and in this meta-analysis we have put together all the studies that have performed antibiotic prophylaxis for urinary tract infection, and we have checked if there was any difference in the occurrence of uh, renal scarring in patients who uh, received or not prophylaxis, and as you can see there was no differences. In, uh, uh, in the occurrence of um, renal scarring among patients who receive it or not antibiotic prophylaxis. So what we can, uh, we can say is that previous studies have focused most, mostly on patients with low-grade VUR, that is a, a condition very different from patients with high-grade VUR who are uh, mostly boys who are patients who have a congenital dilation of kidneys, mostly associated with kidney damage, and that they have the most important risk of um, CKD in uh, uh, later in, the, in, in their follow-up. So uh, while previous studies have assessed the role of antibiotic prophylaxis, they have focused mostly on patients with low-grade VUR and females, and mostly in and exclusively, not, not mostly, because there is no study performed before the occurrence of the first urinary tract infection. And with this rationale, we, Giovanni Montini and the, the ESCAPE group, uh, we have uh, designed the predict trial to understand the efficacy of continuous antibiotic prophylaxis in UTI naive infants with high grade VUR. So, those patients who had never had a, 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 a urinary tract infection and who have uh, the most severe form of VUR, the one that is uh, present at birth, that is not associated with. Uh, blood and bowel dysfunction, and it is uh, mostly associated with congenital kidney damage. So what we have done, we have uh, in, uh, enrolled patient uh, aged one to five months who had a grade two five, uh, um, grade three to five vesicular urethral reflux and no previous urinary tract infection. We have excluded patients with urethral valves that I told you have a different uh, prognosis, and we have excluded all patients with previous urinary tract infection or uh, urinary tract uh, uh, urinary tract obstruction. Uh, we have a rolled patient uh, that uh, um, were identified to have VR mostly because of prenatal uh, screening or postnatal US screening. Um, and we have we managed to enroll 290 patients with VUR grade three to five. Patients were randomized to group A, no treatment, and group B, antibiotic prophylaxis. They were followed for 24 months, uh, the period in which group B 
performed during uh, antibiotic prophylaxis. And then they were checked um, again with VUC, uh, VCUG, so to check the, the um, vesicle urethral reflux, and the MSA scan to compare the data at baseline. Uh, I didn't mention that, but all patients at the enrollment perform a, a urinal, um, a, a urinary and brother ultrasonography, FUCUG, and, a, and the, the MSA scan to assess the uh, kidney parenchyma in all patients. And of course, they were checked for uh, creatinine to check the renal function. And after the first two years of study, of the study, we checked again uh, the kidney with US DMSA, and we checked again BC, uh, the urethral reflux with VCUG. The study has also another uh, three years of follow-up, up to five years um, of follow-up uh, from the enrollment to assess the renal function. What we have already performed and what we managed to complete was the first two years of follow-up that was the, our uh, primary uh, endpoint. And as Marina told you, we are very uh, happy because the results of the, the PREDICT trial were published on um, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine in the, uh, on September of this year. And uh, this was a very uh, important uh, um, achievement, not just for me, but for, uh, and for Giovanni, but for the PREDICT study group, let's say for all the uh, doctors and uh, all the centers that uh, um, made this possible. So I start from here thanking all centers that have been uh, doing the study uh, with us. Uh, as I told you, we screened patients with uh, um, prenatal abnormalities. We uh, randomized 292 patients. They were randomized um, in, uh, in the same uh, number from, for prophylaxis or no prophylaxis. 146 for both groups. Uh, this is the, um, the enrollment by centers. Uh, as you can see, this study was a very important uh, effort for, uh, for the, 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 the escape group. The 39 centers were participating, participating and without them, we were not able to enroll this uh, huge population. And what about the population? Uh, as uh, you can see, we have mostly patient, male patients, 77% of patients were male. And this is not surprising because we enrolled patients with primary VUR. The one that I told you is related to kidney damage and that is uh, uh, associated with prenatal um, ultrasonography um, um, abnormalities. Uh, so this is what we expected to find. Also, uh, we have a very low median age because we are all a patient with a, around three months of age. And sorry, and um, we have most patients with high, very high grade VUR with um, VUR grade four and five accounted for more than 80% of enrolled patients. We have patients, but something that is quite interesting to, to uh, point out for, for the population is that at the baseline, the MSA scan before any previous urinary tract infection, we had already some kind of kidney damage. Uh, more than 50% uh, uh, of patients had a reduced DMSA split function. But what is very, very interesting is that we had uh, around 30% of patients who had already a local defect on the, on the DMSA scan at the beginning of the trial, at the enrollment, before any urinary tract infection. So if those patients 
we're seeing after the first urinary tract infection, we would have considered this local defect as a urinary uh, a UTI related kidney scarring, but we can now say that this is congenital damage. And uh, just to point out a few other characteristic of, of the um, baseline characteristics of the population, uh, most patients had uh, pre pelvic dilation at the, the enrollment, 70%, but I want to show, but some of them, 30%, have no pelvic dilation at the beginning of the study. And also, uh, uh, as regards ureteric dilation, only 50% of patients had the ureteric dilation. That is a sign of, uh, that is one of the most important signs of reflux at the ultrasonography. But in our population, only 50% had the ureteric, ureteric dilation. Um, we have a randomized patient to prophylaxis or not prophylaxis. For prophylaxis, we have led, uh, we have uh, uh, left the choice to to um, to choose the best antibiotics to to the centers. Why we we choose that? Because we performed a very uh, large study, a rolled a rolling patient from uh, different countries in Europe where there is a very different pattern of uh, resistance to antibiotics. So we left the decision to what was the best antibiotics to use for prophylaxis to the, uh, the, the leading investigator to uh, overcome the resistance in uh, the local resistance. What about the primary outcome? Uh, as you can see, we had the first urinary tract infection in 31 patients in the prophylaxis group and, and in the 52% patient in the, the uh, untreated group. This difference is statistically significant, but we will um, discuss later how <laughs> this is less significant uh, according to the, the, the clinical value. Uh, this is the Kaplan-Meier that uh, summarizes the, 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 the primary endpoint in the two populations. As you can see, uh, there is a difference among groups uh, um, according to the primary endpoint, the first symptomatic urinary tract infection. Uh, but this difference, even if it is uh, uh, statistically significant, is not a big difference. We have around 14% of difference among the two groups. Also, as you can see, most of the untreated patients, so patients who had not received antibiotic prophylaxis for the uh, full follow-up, so two years, so patients with congenital kidney damage, with vesicle ureteral reflux three, three to five, uh, so most of those patients, 60, 65%, around 65%, had no urinary tract infection during the, the two years um, follow-ups of the study. Moreover, as we have seen in other study, we had a large uh, number needed to treat, that was seven, so we needed to treat with antibiotic prophylaxis seven patients for two years to prevent one uh, symptomatic urinary tract infection. Those are the uh, UTIs bar, uh, uh, by gender. Uh, as expected, female patients had uh, the, um, the worst outcome with a, an increasing number of urinary tract infection. As you can see, the, uh, this is the curve for patients receiving prophylaxis, for boys receiving prophylaxis. And this is the curve for boys not receiving prophylaxis. The difference is less important in those patients. And they are, as I told you before, 77% of the uh, world population. The, 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 the difference here is just significant. So 0 0.049 uh, for the p-value, while the difference is more important for females. When we combine the VR grade and the gender, we have uh, this uh, uh, sixth uh, combination. 
And as you can see, prophylaxis is effective, let's say, in reducing the, 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 the risk of the first urinary tract infection in patients with, in male patients with grade four VR and in female patients with grade four, grade five VR. But uh, prophylaxis has no effect in all patients with grade three VR. As you can see, there is no difference in male, but also in female patients. And prophylaxis has no effect in the most important, most um, large, the, the largest uh, part of the population with in children with in male children with uh, grade five UR that were around 100 of patients. And in this very high risk population, prophylaxis, prof, antibiotic prophylaxis has no effect on the risk of urinary tract infection. Uh, this is the UTI free survival by type of antibiotics. This is, this is of, uh, of course something that I want to show you just to uh, let you see that there is no difference among the type of antibiotic that was used uh, in, in the outcome. So this is the difference um, in, in the outcome was not related to the type of antibiotic that was chosen for the prophylaxis. But what about the secondary outcomes? That, uh, let me say, we choose the first urinary tract infection as the primary uh, outcome because this is what we can check easily but what we care is not having a uti but is having renal damage so let's focus on the secondary outcomes we have as i told you we have performed a sec second dmsa scan at 24 months to assess the occurrence of new kidney scarring. And as you can see, there is no difference uh, between groups in the occurrence of new kidney scarring in patients receiving prophylaxis or not receiving prophylaxis. Similarly, we have no difference in the EGFR in patient at two years, in patient receiving or not receiving prophylaxis. When we try to put together, and this is a quite complicated figure and Giovanni uh, doesn't like it, but I like it uh, actually, because this uh, figure combines together the occurrence of new kidney scarring, uh, the, the number of UTIs and the, the group, prophylaxis or no prophylaxis. In these three, square you can see the blue squares you can see patients who have the same number of scars at the beginning and the end of the study and they are the majority so and what we can see from from this picture is that most patients do not change the number of kidney scar from the baseline to the end of the study but the most important thing is that there is no association, statistical significant association between prophylaxis and scarring, but also between urinary tract infection and scarring, including those having uh, um, recurrent urinary tract infection. What we have seen also is that UTI isolated were different in patients who had the urinary tract infection, of course, were different among groups. So while most of patients in the no prophylaxis group had the E. coli infection, uh, non E. coli infection and all the pseudomonas infection occurred in the uh, prophylaxis group. So we have we had a shift in the type, in the isolate, um, giving urinary tract infection in patients having um, receiving prophylaxis with the non E. coli and pseudomonas infection mostly in patients receiving prophylaxis. And this is uh, on, on the same uh, side, we, we, uh, we checked resistant to at least two first line, and, uh, first line antibiotics in the isolate that gave pro 
in urinary tract infection in patients receiving or not receiving prophylaxis. And as you can see, we have 52% of isolate resistant to at least two first-line antibiotics in patients receiving prophylaxis, while this was very, very less common in patients from the untreated group. So we have an increased risk to, of, of antibiotic resistance in patients who were receiving prophylaxis. And uh, uh, another uh, very interesting uh, data is that we, while we have less urinary tract infection in, uh, in patients receiving prophylaxis, zero uh, um, urinary tract infection uh, was more, not having a urinary tract infection was more common in patients uh, rece patient receiving antibiotic prophylaxis. Uh, the, the other point is that re recurrent urinary tract infection defined as three or more than uh, three urinary tract infection were more common in patients receiving prophylaxis. So in other words, we have, we, we, with prophylaxis, we are reducing the number of urinary tract infection in patients receiving prophylaxis, but those patients were more prone to have recurrent urinary tract infection were more easily found in the prophylaxis group. And we can speculate, of course, this is a secondary outcome. We have no uh, statistical power to uh, assess that, but we can speculate that this is related to the occurrence of uh, antibiotic resistance. So uh, patients who are receiving antibiotic prophylaxis have a selection of resistant bacteria that are more prone to give, to, um, uh, give more uh, recurrent urinary tract infections. Um, we, uh, this is something that we check at baseline. We have another publication on the frontiers uh, in pediatric nephrology where we check at baseline patients who were receiving antibiotic prophylaxis before the enrollment. And at baseline, we uh, were able to demonstrate that there was a change in CAD microbiota already after a median time of 27 days of antibiotic prophylaxis. What we are planning to do in the next uh, months and years is the, to assess the gut microbiota trajectories in patients receiving or not receiving prophylaxis in our trial. We have collected for this purpose um, um, stool samples at the beginning of the study and uh, uh, at all the time points up to uh, five years of uh, follow-up. So we want to understand if gut micro microbiota trajectory are affected uh, in patients receiving prophylaxis as it is affected the spectrum of uh, um, antibiotic resistance and the type of uh, isolate that is uh, giving uh, anti urinary tract infections. Also, we are uh, we have an ongoing collaboration with Zurich with Olivier de Vust for the uh, assessment of uh, humod uh, polymorphisms in uh, patients with uh, um, urinary tract infection or without urinary tract infection because uh, the the very imp one of the most important points of our study is that most of the patients without prophylaxis has no urinary tract infection at all, even if they have a very important uh, VUR grade three to five. So we want to understand why some of patients have, has infection and some other uh, have not. Of course, we want to extend the, the, the follow-up at five years to understand if there is some difference in the um, uh, kidney function up to five years, and we are planning to extend the follow-up up to 15 years to uh, assess the renal function even after the puberty, that is the time when patients with CACUT, with congenital abnormalities of kidney and urinary tract may have uh, a deterioration of the urinary, uh, the, of the kidney function. So, in conclusion, 
and I hope I have respected the timing. <laughs> we have found a small but significant benefit on antibiotic prophylaxis in preventing the first urinary tract infection in young infants with vesicle urethral reflux without previous urinary tract infection. But our data do not support the, uris, the routine use of um, antibiotic prophylaxis in children with uh, um, vesicle urethral reflux. Why? Because we have a large number of patients, the majority of patients without any treatment who did not have any UTI because we have a large number needed to treat with with a, uh, to prevent the first uh, to prevent one UTI because we do not have differences in the second outcomes that are mostly the <laughs> that, that are the most important ones the occurrence of kidney scarring and the EGFR at two years and because UTIs were easily managed in both group with most patients treated six over 60 percent of patients with uti were treated with the oral antibiotics and of course because of the emergence of resistance strains so what predict trial will uh, will uh, tell us is that we need to use less prophylaxis maybe we have to uh, use uh, a reduced number of uh, uh, images uh, um, uh, imaging for patients with suspected of uh, a certain the vesicle urethral view are and we hope that the results of the uh, predict trial will lead to less antibiotic resistance in the future let me say thank to all the centers who have participated to this large study that uh, was that started in 2013 so uh, it, it is a very important effort for for us but also for all the uh, centers who have participated to to the study and uh, thank you for your attention thank you so much william um can you just leave on the slide yeah so we can um uh so the next webinars, um, sorry, and just the next yeah, one. Yeah, sorry. No, no, just because I need to remind people. So the next webinars for the ERCNET will be on November 21st with Adin Birkenkamp speaking about um, Lois syndrome, and there will be also the patient voice. And then at the beginning of December, on December 5th, Jalila Mekali is going to be speaking about ADPKD in children. Okay, um, now let's focus on um, your presentation. I think it's absolutely interesting and important um, results. And, um, you know, I think it will be interesting to see um, their applicability in the real world and how um, this will change our practice. So I'm uh, interested to see what um, other people think about this. And um, in the meantime, while we're waiting for questions, um, I remind you, if you have questions, to please post them on the chat. So then um, I'm a moderator and I can, um, uh, I can read them out and, um, to William and give him the opportunity to, to reply. Um, I, we forgot to say this at the beginning, so I'll repeat it now. Um, for any question, please um, write it down in the chat. And in this way, we can, um, we can um, make the, the question known to, um, to our speaker, to William Morello. While um, things are heating up, I wanted to ask you a couple of things. Um, my first question, I guess, is um, what about um, stratification? Did you have the numbers or did you try in some way to see if there was a difference between, you know, a child who had a grade um, two or versus a grade five um, uh, vesicle ureteral reflux? Because I guess we always tend to give this a lot of value and it would be interesting to understand if yeah. this does value or not. Yes, uh, we uh, let me go back to this. We have enrolled all only patients with high grade VUR, so okay. patients that were enrolled in the trial had the, at least a grade three uh, VUR. So the ones we uh, could expect to have the worst worst prognosis and the, the higher uh, risk of urinary tract infection. 
and uh, um, we uh, as as you can see from this um, uh, couple of miles curves we have a uh, combined the uh, the risk of the first urinary tract infection according to um, the gender and the VUR. Of course, females that you can see in the button of the of the slide have a have a, the worst outcome with a higher number of uh, urinary tract infection. This is expected. This is expected because of the the anatomy, of course, and because it, this is expected because of the um, uh, epidemiology studies and but it, it is uh, quite uh, uh, impressive to 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 see that we have no differences uh, and in those patients we have uh, we have uh, 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 the highest effect of prophylaxis in preventing urinary tract infection what you can see here in the on top of the slide is that for male patients instead the difference is most uh, mostly not significant with patients with grade 5 uh, urine vesicular ureter reflux having no differences in the occurrence of urinary tract infection in according to the prophylaxis so as you can see the cures are identical even if they were taking or not antibiotic prophylaxis. So this is a, a very surprising, uh, <laughs> so let me say, um, uh, information that we had from this study. But also in other patients with grade 3, there is no statistically significant from um, in patients with, with or without prophylaxis. And also for patients with grade 5, 4, sorry, the difference was not very important in uh, male patients. So the point is, uh, we have, uh, uh, of course, uh, we have a difference between male and females, but uh, instead, according to the grade of reflux, it doesn't seem to, to be a very important uh, variable that affects the, the, the the effect, sorry, for the 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 the, the, the that affects the, the effect of a prophylaxis. So uh, females are with grade five are the ones who have the great effect of prophylaxis. Okay, so you would say that um, the gender makes a difference, but not um, degree of VUR when you're mm. looking at three, four, and five. Yeah when when you look yes looking and uh, yes and i want to stress again that this is what we are checking for the primary endpoint that is the occurrence of urinary tract infection but this is maybe the the, the only uh, uh, reasonable um, endpoint but this is not the the one that we are actually looking for because we want to check if uh, we can do something to prevent kidney damage in patients who have already kidney damage at the uh, at the birth because i showed you yeah 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 that uh, most of the patients had already most okay that uh, uh, an important percentage of patients had already local scar at the beginning of the trial yeah. so they have a kidney damage, congenital kidney damage, we want to prevent the, 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 the progression of this damage. And yeah. uh, in that case, we have no uh, difference. So that brings me straight to my second question, because I think one of the most fascinating results of this study is that it sort of seems to Im imply that one of the central tenets that we have in mind uh, which is that a UTI, lead, a febrile UTI leads to a scar. You know, we always tell our patients we have to avoid febrile UTIs because each febrile UTI is an accumulation of a little scar. And instead, here it seems to imply that um, what we see and what we call scars on DMSA, for, maybe we should even change the terminology, 
is dysplasia. Yeah. It's not a scar. Um, and even when you look at who has and does not have a febrile UTI during your study, that doesn't really seem to um, affect what we call as scars. So could you comment on that? Are those scars or is that dysplasia? Is, should, is this something that you think should really change the way we think about the effect on um, kidney damage of um, a febrile UTI? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I think this is a very important uh, uh, finding of our study. Of course, I must uh, uh, underline that the study could not be um, uh, empowered to check uh, uh, new kidney scarring because, of course, we needed to have a, a very large, we have a, a large number because we have almost 300 patients, but we would have needed uh, a, a bigger number for checking that as a primary outcome, uh, even though we have no difference, as you can see, in the new kidney scarring. And this information, combined with the, the finding that we have 25% uh, of patients having already scarring before any urinary tract infection at the beginning of the study, and together with the information, we have no statistically significant association between urinary tract infection and new kidney scarring, uh, yes, all these elements leads us to think that this is congenital damage and maybe we should not uh, call it uh, uh, scarring, but maybe dysplasia, as you were suggesting. So this is a very important point of our study. Okay, great. So in the meantime, we've gotten a really good um, question from um, the, the um, ERCNET participants. Unfortunately, I don't know if it's, if it's me being um, dull, but I can't um, see who is making the question. I'll read it out to you. Um, so um, the question says, congratulations on a wonderful presentation. Um, since no UTI was prevalent in the VUR um, without prophylaxis group, would you speculate that adding one UTI episode in the selection of patients would raise the benefit of prophylaxis? Yeah, I, I guess so. So uh, one something that has to be uh, stressed is that we enroll only patients without previous urinary tract infection because we wanted, because our objective was to understand what we have to do with patients with high-grade VUR that are uh, found uh, at, at birth on the, the first months of life, life, we have to, to use prophylaxis in those patients or not. But we haven't, our primary endpoint was not the recurrence of urinary tract infection. So maybe, let me, I'm not sure if I can go still back to the, maybe those patients who are, can you see my pointers? Uh, yes. Okay. Maybe those patients having a first urinary tract infection, maybe they have a higher risk of uh, urinary tract infections. So they, for some reason that we we have to check, maybe it's U mode that we are going to check. Maybe it's a combination. And this is my opinion of different factors. So those patients having a first urinary tract infection and maybe having a recurrent urinary tract infection, so they are the ones who are candidate for antibiotic prophylaxis. And this is what we, me, Giovanni, and, and those who, who were participating to the trial are now doing in clinical practice. So we are trying to uh, select patients to use prophylaxis uh, um, according to the occurrence of urinary tract infection and maybe the gender. Yeah. I'm not so, sure if, um, I, if, if I answered the question. No, no, I think you did. I think um, one of the, um, in, in terms of then applicability to real world of this study, I, I think one of the um, limitations, but also one of the beauties of the study is the fact that many, many of the patients who present at least to um, 
the second or third level centers will be um, children who have already had at least one um, UTI. So that this is a really important um, question moving forward. But you selected very small children who had been um, screened, um, you know, in, uh, with prenatal with prenatal screening. So it's um, it's a it's a a subgroup of the of the patients that we um, that we see in routine clinical practice, I think. Yeah, yeah. But as you as you know, if if you uh, speak with urologists and uh, uh, that they are the ones who are who perform their um, visits at the the, the uh, neonatal uh, uh, department when you have a patient with. A, uh, congenital dilation, what they suggest usually is to start prophylaxis. So all patients Absolutely. who have a, a prenatal urinary tract uh, dilation, they are used to take prophylaxis because they Absolutely. are, because mm, physician, they are thinking that this is the best way and we have to change this uh, behavior and to try to use prophylaxis only in those who will come back with a urinary tract infection. Absolutely, yes, yes, this is absolutely right. That's exactly why, why I think it's important to stress this element. Thank you, William. So in the meantime, other two questions have come through. Um, Philip Wornell has asked regarding the issue of the scars. So what would be the cause of scars if not from UTI? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that, that's a very um, important question. Thanks for the question. Uh, uh, yeah, we we can we have performed the MSA scan in the very young children. They were they had a three months uh, me, a median age of three months uh, at the beginning of the trial. So maybe some of the new scar that we can see later. Uh, or new defect, let's start using this term. Uh, some of the new defects that we can see at the follow-up the MSA scan, they may be uh, something that we couldn't see because of the age of the patient and because of the uh, dimension of the kidney. So we have discussed that with, with the um, nuclear medicine doctors that have reviewed the, the images and uh, they, they said, yes, this is a possibility that uh, some of the defects that were not uh, seen at the beginning were already there, but we couldn't see because of the age of the patients. Of course. Okay, we have another question. Thank you so much. We have another question coming in from um, Evgenia Preka, Jenny Preka, and she is asking, um, did you have any way, how did you check um, regarding compliance in terms of um, the antibiotic prophylaxis in um, the group of patients who were on the antibiotic prophylaxis. And she also congratulates you for um, this study and thanks you for presenting your results. Yeah, that, uh, thank you. And uh, this is another point, very important point. Uh, we, um, at every, uh, of course, compliance is an issue for every study. In, in that study, uh, we, uh, we checked compliance with, at each clinical visit uh, with a diary that patient they had to um, uh, bring uh, at, every, at every visit to show that um, their child uh, as having, as taking, was taking uh, the antibiotic prophylaxis. Of course, we, we thought of many, many uh, type of different, uh, many different type of uh, methods to assess compliance, even the uh, checking the residual antimicrobial residual in the um, in the urines, but it it wasn't possible to be performing this very large population. So we counted on the uh, on what was reported by parents at each visit. Uh, we uh, of course, profil uh, compliance is an important issue in, in many trials, but in that population that is uh, made of infants uh, uh, that are uh, handled by uh, parents, I guess this couldn't be a very important problem. But of course, uh, we relied because, of course, uh, 
children were taking prophylaxis given by parents. Uh, in any case, this was the method that we used to assess pro, uh, compliance. At each visit, we had a diary of uh, uh, prophylaxis. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So then we have um, another, now the questions are rolling in. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of editing. And um, uh, there's um, a physician um, called Ab Abdelhami Hamdi, who has um, first um, given a sort of comment to the scarring issue, saying um, perhaps reflux itself can increase fibrosis and scarring. Um, and he also asks, uh, so okay, let's hear it from the expert. When do you, when do you give prophylaxis at this point in your clinical practice? I think you sort of briefly mentioned it before, um, but um, I think that would be a really nice way of sort of capping this up um, and, and sending home everyone with a with a clear um, message. So in your clinical practice, having seen the results of this trial and having you know created them, um, when you are giving advice to a young fellow, when would you give advice to actually use antibiotic prophylaxis, William? Personally, but I don't want to. <laughs> to, to, to no, 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 no. Uh, this is clearly opinion based. Uh, yes, this is uh, my opinion. I don't, don't want to say that is the best way to do. I start prophylaxis after the second urinary tract infection. So uh, not, not even after the first urinary tract infection. So I do not start uh, antibiotic prophylaxis if we have a, 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 a congenital diagnosis or perinatal, let's say, diagnosis of UR. I will wait if there is a first urinary tract infection to understand if there is a, this patient is more prone to have recurrent urinary tract infection. And of course, if I have a second urinary tract infection in, in a small child and the for many reasons that are maybe are not related to my uh, fear to to see the kidney damage, but but mostly to to the 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 the, the, the to be practical and to to be also uh, in line with what patients may need and uh, and the risk of course of severe urinary tract infection. If if I have a second urinary tract infection, I start antibiotic prophylaxis. This is my personal. Uh, um, I may start uh, prophylaxis after the first urinary tract infection in females if they have a, a very important uh, VUR, so grade four or five. Okay. Uh, by, uh, to, to answer the, the first question, I do, not, I do not believe that VUR itself is leading to scars. But I hope that the longer follow-up that we are planning to have with the MSA scan at five years and maybe at 15 years will 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 give you some other insights on that. Because if VR itself is the reason for scarring, we should see more scarring in the in the future. Okay, um, we only have one minute left. Um, Dr. Conversano from our group actually wrote, do you recommend prophylaxis um, before assessing cystography? But I think so, you definitely don't because you always wait for at least, okay. <laughs> And I have yes. a final question, and then I think we can wrap it up. Thank you so much for your patience. So in your decision of starting or not starting antibiotic prophylaxis, the, does the kidney function of the patient pay, play a role? So if you have a small child with a high um, level um, reflux, um, high grade reflux, does it make a difference whether or not they have normal kidney function or um, whether they have um, uh, already a certain degree of um, kidney failure? Not before the first urinary tract infection and I and after the results of our study, I'm I, I even more uh, um, yeah, I, I believe that these strategies can be safely uh, use it because, as you can see, there is no difference in the EGFR and the kidney damage at the follow-up, uh, uh, um, uh, at three years follow-up in uh, patient receiving or not prophylaxis. So uh, I, I do not uh, count that uh, as an indication for prophylaxis. 
Okay, perfect. I just wanted I just wanted this to be clear for everyone. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, at this point, if you can put it again to the last slide, just so that people remember when yeah, the next webinar course, is. And that right. was really interesting, William. We had a lot of questions, oh. which is always a very good sign. So thank you so much and um, for your time and um, uh, greetings uh, to everyone um, who joined us today. Thank you for joining. And uh, we will see you on November 21st with Aden Birkenham Camp to discuss um, also with a patient voice um, the um, different aspects of Lowe syndrome. Um, a wonderful afternoon to everyone from Rome and thank you again very much, um, William Morello, for this wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.